I'd like to welcome Mr. David Arkless for an interview as part of our Ustinov Meet series to celebrate Sir Peter Ustinov's 100th birthday. Sir Peter Ustinov was a multi-award winning actor and writer, UNICEF Goodwill Ambassador and Chancellor of Durham University from 1992 until his death in 2004. Sir Peter Ustinov was the person after whom our college is named and his commitment to global citizenship, diversity and equality continues to be reflected through the mission and values of Ustinov College today. We are delighted to welcome David Arkless to explore themes close to Sir Peter's own interests as part of our celebrations in the week that would have seen his 100th birthday. It's a pleasure to have you here today and to have the opportunity to learn more about your experiences and career, David. Thank you for your time. So David is a founder and chairman of Arclight Consulting and the Future Work Consortium, an honorary professor at Durham University, a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts, advisor to a wide and impressive array of international non-governmental organizations and governments, and a leader in the expansion of corporate social responsibility. David, I'd like to start by talking about your international career to date. So in regard to your humanitarian work, you share values and an ethos with Sir Peter, having supported UN initiatives, founded your own um, organizations, initiated significant acts and corporate behaviors. So you first became engaged with the fight against human trafficking through Queen Sylvia of Sweden, who reached out to you personally. Uh, but what continues to inspire you to wake up every single day and affect this change? One of my um, favorite lines from a, a movie, which um, you know uh, younger people might remember or might not, the movie is called The Untouchables, and it's the story of how the infamous gangster Al Capone was eventually brought down by a set of um, itinerant policemen uh, and tax um, investigators called The Untouchables. And in the end, they get Al Capone at the almost the end of Prohibition, uh, not for uh, everything he'd done, including human trafficking, uh, you know, um, promoting prostitution, um, running thousands and thousands of gallons of, of um, uh, what they call booze across the border from Canada. They got him in the end for a tax misdemeanor and forensically had prepared a case of how to bring this man down because he was almost untouchable, that's why they called the police the untouchables. And in the end, in the court case, uh, Kevin Costner, who is the head of the untouchables, walks up to Capone, who is going apoplectic because he's just been found guilty of tax evasion. And Costner just says, never give up till the fight is done. It's just what it, and that reflects my whole view on um, humanitarian causes, what we've tried to do in the past, what we're trying to do now, the fight isn't done. Uh, in fact, I'm not quite sure that we're that much further forward globally uh, when you see the global press about oppression of certain um, individuals in countries in Southeast Asia, in China, uh, in South America. I'm not sure that we're that much further forward. Uh, have we really learned the lesson? But for anyone that is impassioned uh, to try to make a difference, I say never give up till the fight is done. That's, if you like, my daily mantra. It's a good one to live by. Um, and your work on corporate social responsibility has revolutionized the idea of the untouchable. Uh, through your work in Nepal, you stated that the issue with uh, humanitarian interventions is their nature, that organizations enter to apply a short-term solution to a long-term problem. Why do you think it's so important for corporations to be held accountable as well as governments? Because over the last 30 years, which is basically the time I've been more deeply involved with um, uh, social responsibility um, and, and also running huge corporations, uh, just as a pastime, um, I, I've found that there are no unilateral solutions to any social um, um, uh, problems or issues. They've got to be multilateral. And that might sound, sound obvious, and yeah, it is obvious. You need to have um, international organizations, governmental organizations, not-for-profit, um, passion-led organizations, um, corporations, um, you know, a bunch of people that appear on a common somewhere with some banners. You need everyone to try to move this, this problem forward one inch. So 
you know, my message to all of the, and I'm still involved with a huge number of um, initiatives, is look, we need to make this initiative or what we're trying to do here uh, or this lobbying with this government or this with the UN, we need to make it multilateral because the stronger the coalition that tries to do something, the more likelihood you have at actually making a difference. Because you know these, these things that we talk we talk about uh, modern day slavery, um, um, you know, um, cross border international uh, bondage of workers, um, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These are huge global issues, and in themselves, if you just went as a doctoral student or whatever and looked at any of them you'd find out how hugely complex they are. And then if you look back, um, which I'm just gonna tell this story, as I am right now, because not, I'm not just uh, doing lectures at the university uh, and as also a, um, a lecturer at INSEAD and Stanford, um, but I'm also submitting, stupidly, um, a doctorate, um, which is about, um, Initially, I thought uh, it's going to be about human performance in the future, given the exposure I'd had to millions of workers and millions of uh, work situations over the decades. In the end, I decided to make uh, the doctorate about the difference leadership can make in a social change. And I've, I've chosen a very kind of tight um, area because all of my, my supervisors, by the way, at the university are great. And it's really odd, though, having your supervisors on your lectures sometimes, which makes it odd to be a professor and a doctoral student. But anyway, um, you know, if you, if you look at issues like modern day slavery, um, you, you then start by going back and, and you choose, OK, I'm going to look at modern day slavery in the United Kingdom, uh, because I was previously very and still am very much involved with legislation in the uh, the country that tries to um, reduce uh, modern day slavery and um, you know uh, human trafficking in the United Kingdom um, you, you look back and you go ah they thought they had an answer to slavery not just in the United Kingdom but in the new colonies of the United States um, to uh, and to Brazil by uh, restricting um, shipping from West Africa with human um, beings on board. That was the time of Wilberforce, of course. And they, they were convinced when they passed the Maritime Act, which it's a bit like the Untouchables. So they got Capone because of tax evasion. They managed to stop mostly modern um, slavery back in Wilberforce's time by passing a Maritime Act. So it's kind of interesting. So you look back and you go, ah, sometimes you've got to come at an issue from an acute angle, not face on. Like, I've tried this by the way, go to the UN General Assembly and say, you're a disgrace, every one of you countries, you must now sign up to this declaration to immediately stop the, um, the despicable work of modern day traffickers. So sign this. And then, honestly, when you go to the UN General Assembly, uh, I, I swear, it's like reading Shakespeare to chickens. So, you know, they sit there and they kind of go like this and then nothing happens. So I, I learned from a number of experiences that that maybe uh, a direct approach is not the most uh, wise. So let's try and fix this from some angles, which is why I've always gone and looked at the experience of uh, what Wilberforce managed to get passed in the Maritime Act, um, what Prohibition did, how they got Al Capone, um, etc. To go, we need to be really smart about this. But the bottom line of it, I go back to my previous point, is every solution, because these societal issues or humanitarian issues or human society issues are so complex because of different governance, different cultures, different um, uh, influences, the whole thing. We need to be totally multilateral in our approach to trying to change anything. And that's what I spend my time trying to do now.
It sounds like you're quite invested in the idea of the third UN, where you're getting private foundations, NGOs involved in your movement. And I was wondering yeah. what's been your most valuable resource in encouraging global corporate social responsibility movement? And by the way, I, I, I find this idea of the third UN um, um, uh, very interesting. Um, or the second UN, uh, or do we count the League of Nations as a UN and that where well, we we're on to four or anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, one thing I would do, uh, and I, I haven't talked to uh, people that are espousing this, uh, mostly because I'm also working uh, right now advising an old friend of mine who used to be the Prime Minister of Portugal, then he became the head of UNHCR and now is the UN Secretary General. Um, we call him Tony, but it is Antonio Guterres. Um, I'm, I'm working with him on how to revolutionize the structure of the United Nations because it is not fit for purpose, it doesn't work. So what I would advise uh, anyone that's trying to put together the next UN is that's the last thing you should call it because, believe it or not, um, and of course, you're going to say this is because you come from a commercial background or whatever else. You know, half of getting the story done is the brand, the projection, and then the implementation. So I'd say don't call yourself a UN3 or Sputnik 95.7 or, or something. Come up with something original. But, you know, seriously, what, what, what um, I found most useful in. Uh, my work in corporations was finding a way to persuade corporations that social change, influence and corporate responsibility was not just a good thing to do. You need it on your annual report and whatever else, but it's better for the bottom line. So uh, just a very quick explanation. When we uh, got into the world of trying to uh, help refugees stop human trafficking and stop uh, the cross-border uh, abuse uh, of, of, of migrant workers. Um, I went to the board of Manpower uh, Group where I was a president at the uh, time and I thought this is easy. I just go and I say we should do these things because it'll look great and they said how much and I said x million a year and they chucked me out of the boardroom and I thought right I've, I've got to think about this differently somehow. So what I then did was to say, okay, we've just rebranded the group. You know, we wanted a new fancy swish like Nike or something, but that isn't really what rebranding is. Rebranding is about finding the real core of your mission, the passion of the company, and how you uh, engage your customers, suppliers, associates, employees with that that core mission. So. We looked at, I looked at uh, what we'd said our purpose was, um, you know, for more than 50 years, we would put more people into uh, safe jobs and work than anybody commercially on the planet. And if that is your core mission, surely you must have a dark side to that, which is we are against everything that militates for our, um, you know, against our core mission. So if we said, okay, we want to give everybody on the planet the opportunity through decent training development, um, work opportunities in good and safe workplaces, we therefore must be against everything that doesn't allow that. And I came up with three things, uh, human trafficking, uh, abuse of migrant workers, um, and, you know, the, the, people on this planet that have the least chance of getting a job anywhere are um, refugees. And so we said, okay, let's, let's do that. And so then I went back to the board and said, why don't we um, do it in these areas? Because we'd look great. And it'll only cost this, which was double what I'd said in the first place. And then they kicked me out of the boardroom again. Uh, and I said, okay, we need to get smart with this. What we had found from our survey of all of our associates, customers, suppliers, in the rebranding process, which was done by um, that famous uh, Irish firm, McKinsey. No, I'm just joking. Yeah, you know McKinsey. Um, they found out from a survey that 
our employees almost universally um, around the globe in 126 countries said, we've done one of the most noble things on this planet for 50 years, which is find people decent work. But we don't stand for anything on a global basis. And so that's when I came up with the, why do we stand for this that fights against our objective and try to solve it? Uh, it was fairly easy from there to go back to the board and say, I've decided uh, to do this and here's why you're going to pay for it in three partnerships, one with the International Organization of Migration, one with UNHCR, and I can't find a really good global anti-modern day slavery human trafficking organization. There isn't one. So I'm going to start one on our behalf. And then I went back to them and said, that's what we're going to do. And then kicked me out again. And then finally, I said, here's why the investment is worth it. If one employs, as we did back then, up to 18 million people a year around the world, um, a huge cost in that commercial model is what the Americans call attrition, um, you know, which is people leaving the organization, either hired or fired or whatever. And I did this with our chief financial officer, a calculation that showed if in some way I could reduce our annual attrition by 1%, it, you know, because you know, when somebody gets fired, that's not the cost. The cost is replacement, the cost is loss of knowledge, the cost is uh, loss of customer relationships, the cost is et cetera, et cetera. So we put this fantastic ROI um, kind of projection together and said, if we can reduce the um, attrition of the corporation by 1%, it will save, listen to this, the corporation just under half a billion US dollars a year. And you know, because the chief financial officer did this um, analytic with me, we went back to the board and said, I want to, um, yeah, I started off with 2 million, then I went to 10. Now I'm going for this amount so that we can get into partnerships that are substantive with these organizations. Um, they agreed completely. And then the secret was turning our mission and passion into what we now call uh, globally employee engagement because we found the more we engaged employees in any country, and we did two experiments, uh, one country where we did no employee engagement, and one country where we did a huge amount and tried my new initiatives in that country, we found that the country where we tried the initiatives improved their employee engagement levels by more than 500%. Employee engagement leads to retention in organizations and we also measured that so we proved in sweden which was probably a bit naughty of me to choose sweden because i knew they'd all get on board immediately um, we found that in sweden over a two-year period of the experiment uh, we saved the swedish organization over 10 million us dollars so you know, you just extrapolate that, take it back to the board and go bang. So that was my introduction to, okay, we want to make a change. It's good for us. It's good for our employees. It's, it's good for the way we look, frankly, as a corporation, uh, our customers will love it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's what got me into this initially. And then when we started doing these experiments in Sweden, for instance, I'd start to get uh, calls from the queen and um, a lady who I still really appreciate, despite the fact that the family uh, hasn't done so, so well over the last uh, few years in Egypt, the um, uh, Suzanne Mubarak, who, despite the reputation of her husband, whatever um, the government did, she was always on a mission of women's empowerment, women's rights, and stopping um, and, uh, human trafficking. Uh, so she called me and then somebody else and then U.S. Department um, of Labor called me and somebody else and, and said, look, OK, we, we've seen what you're saying in your annual report. Um, you've got a partnership with UNHCR. You've got a partnership with the International Organization of Migration and you're doing stuff with them on the first two bits of your pillar of social responsibility. Um, you need to help us put together 
um, a leading global uh, foundation initiative to stop human trafficking that involves a number of parties, governments, corporations, impassioned individuals, the UN, etc. So that's when we got together and started, I can't remember the year, um, I must have been about 10 years old back then, um, given the, all of the water under the bridge, but end human trafficking now and launched the Athens Ethical Principles for Corporations, which was a, essentially a precursor for the legislation that was enacted in the US in the California Act and the acts in a number of different states and also led ultimately into us starting the modern slavery act in the United Kingdom, which was finally, after seven, eight years of work, uh, passed into legislation in 2015. And it's just having a, um, um, a, a refurb right now because in the end it wasn't completely fit for purpose. What, what all of that taught me was, you know, it's fine um, using the power of a corporation, money, uh, if you can persuade the shareholders and the board that, you know, it's worth spending the money, that's okay. But you literally can't get anything done um, just as a corporation. You need to enter into bilateral relationships where in a very positive way and not in the critical way that we often see not-for-profits or charities uh, viewed as, to assist and support them using the stuff that corporations are good at. Guess what we're good at? We're good at making money. We're good at business process. We're good at implementation. We're good at being global. Um, and many, many not-for-profits, and including the United Nations, are absolutely rubbish at implementing initiatives by themselves. So I did a count uh, when you sent me the potential questions for this, and um, found out that since we started on what I would call an initiative for bilateral contribution to social change, um, we could call that UN3, couldn't we? Anyway, no, but um, seriously, um, since we started that, there have been over 1,000 multilateral, bilateral or multilateral um, organisations founded, implementing uh, change. However, the results are still not good enough. So we started something in El Paso Juarez, which is the biggest cross-border trafficking location in the Americas. You know, taking Mexicans and young kids that have been brought uh, from uh, Central America into Mexico and trafficked into uh, by the, uh, the gangs into the United States and then recycled and etc etc. So we managed, um, got a great story about El Paso Juarez because I worked closely with the mayor of uh, Juarez uh, and a great foundation just north of the, um, uh, the border in El Paso. And by the way, just for the um, statistic geeks that might listen to this, El Paso Juarez is the biggest cross-border city in the world. Um, and the Rio Grande River runs right through the middle and I don't know why they call the Rio Grande a river, because in the middle of the summer, it's about that wide. So it's easy to get people to kind of go, go across it. But the story was um, the cartels tried to get me and the mayor in, um, in Juarez and attacked us when we were on a convoy to uh, the university. Um, but the cartels aren't that smart. The Juarez cartel is not that smart because they chose the wrong cavalcade. It was um, a um, US congressional cavalcade that was going to a local meeting on cross-border relationships. So anyway, um, you know, even the, uh, the really efficient guys like the criminals can get it wrong. So I was glad they got it wrong that day because we weren't in hardened cars like the Congress people were. So, so places like El Paso Juarez, we, we made a difference. We substantially reduced cross-border uh, trafficking of people. Um, we founded something in, in Florida for uh, abused um, women and children that had been trafficked into Florida from Cuba and other parts of South America. And we got the great Toyota Foundation to buy us a ranch 
Uh, so the, and refurbish it, a, a tune of about 20 million US dollars. And then we could take uh, displaced women and children, um, house them there, give them coaching, counseling, help their family situation, give them skills and knowledge that could get them into a job, then find them a job and local housing. Yeah, so we solved a little problem in, in, in Florida. We did the same in, um, in the northwest of uh, the US. Uh, out of Seattle, we started uh, an initiative between all small to medium sized enterprises that were registered in the state of Washington. And um, they were one of the first to sign up for the California Act, which said they will ensure that there is no human trafficking in their supply chain and that they will become local ambassadors and um, you know, investigators for trafficking and prostitution on the streets of the state. That has made a huge difference. We, you know, we, we've done so many things in so many different countries, but my frustration is, yeah, I think I learned how to harness corporate um, uh, contribution. I think I learned how to make this multilateral. I think I then learned how through my amazing network, how to start initiatives and then put them in really good hands. But my frustration, uh, when, when I wake up and I say, never stop fighting till the fight is done every morning, is we're a long way from getting the fight done. Uh, just look at what's happening uh, in you know, Myanmar, in parts of China. Um, the trafficking situation is getting worse on the US border, not better. And thank goodness the idiot has gone and they won't finish building a wall because it's not about walls. It's really about empowerment. Why do people move from one place to another? Nobody in the history of mankind has been successful in stopping people moving from one place to another. Go back to the Great Wall of China, the um, you know, Hadrian's Wall, um, the Berlin Wall, everything else. Those were built to stop people going from one place to another. And I've got about 500 examples of ancient um, walls or barriers built to try to stop people moving. They all fail because actually most people, I think, believe that we are humanity and as humans, we have a right to occupy the planet that we're on. Now, I know it gets hugely complicated with regard to you know, governmental um, boundaries and borders and security relationships and all of this stuff. But we still haven't managed to make the leap. And this is my challenge to the UN and to UN related organizations. It's how do we make that leap? And, you know, if, if you talk in the inner circles at the UN, which I do quite often, it's all about yeah, um, fantastic mission, fantastic vision. We should do this, but it'll never happen under the current governance system of the world. Well, I say, like you said earlier, there's a UN3 maybe. Uh, okay, so maybe we need to change the governance system. So for me, the barrier now to complete or more complete social advancement and change is not that we don't have the knowledge the technology, the partnerships, it's the barrier of institutional, um, you know, we don't want to change because we're actually happy the way things operate right now. Of course you are. Yeah? Nobody can tell you what to do. Um, if you don't like something at the UN, it doesn't matter. Eventually it goes to the Security Council and you can get one of your mates to veto it. Uh, for me, we need a much more positive change at global level. Um, as as I, I think, uh, as I maintained earlier, my gorgeous, wonderful um, wife, Connie, uh, sometimes comes into the studio here and says, <laughs> shut up and let her ask some questions. So I'm going to do that. <laughs> well, it was a great answer regardless. <laughs> um, but then I guess to move on, uh, I was wondering, like you said, there are so many barriers. And I was wondering if you had, a, you have any um, when you're balancing your role as a chairman for a for-profit corporation with your role as a key influencer and activist, do you find that people 
or organizations such as the UN maybe hinder your progress? You know, if you if you look through the history of some of the things that we've managed to do bilaterally, like um, the Modern Slavery Act in, in the UK, um, I put together um, a group of businesses that actively um, supported the act, including uh, the originally fairly severe uh, requirements for uh, reporting uh, on um, the, the um, abuse of workers in your supply chain. Now, you will recognize how difficult that is. For, for instance, when you go to um, a company that everybody knows in uh, the UK, like Marks and Spencer, um, they were one of the first to get on board with me, by the way, um, as were Nike and a, a few other great corporations. But, um, you know, the first thing is to go, how complex is a supply chain? And the answer is how far down the supply chain should you, as the person that's selling the gorgeous blouse in Oxford Street or wherever, how far are you responsible for the production of that item? And I've had many debates about you know, the global organizations that you, you know that do work on supply chains and supply chain um, verification and this kind of stuff. It's really hard. So what we, what we had to do was to go to the corporations and say, um, not only do, do we want you to sign up for this, uh, of course it'll make you look good. It, secondly, it's also the right thing to do. But thirdly, we will give you a process that will implement and manage this for you without any cost to your corporation. And then suddenly we got more and more and more and more signing up. But, you know, the issue in that to me was um, working from the corporate side. I'm sorry, because of the constitution of what a corporation or a company is, you have one primary responsibility or else you wouldn't be in the job. If you're in the job um, as an executive director, chairman, president, uh, CEO, you are given in the constitution of organizations one major responsibility, and that is to return profit to shareholders. Okay, so what it took me a while to kind of work out was, okay, how do we balance that with doing the right thing? And then when we got into doing the right thing, like in the uh, Modern Slavery Act in the UK, we were criticized by all of the involved not-for-profits um, for getting involved. And th the reason they criticized us was they said, you're only doing this so you look good. And I said, you know, in this whole thing, no, we're only doing this because it's the right thing to do and it can make us more profitable and you more successful. And that was, that was a huge learning for me that um, whatever a corporation was doing back in 1995, 90, you know, 2000, everything they did from a social corporate responsibility point of view was viewed cynically from everyone, international organizations, not for profits, think tanks, everything else. So part of my journey was learning that actually you've got to somehow synchronize the positioning of different kinds of organizations. And it's way more complicated than just running a $22 billion corporation in 120 countries with, you know, um, quadzillion people working for you. It, it's way harder than that because you don't have any control or power in the situation. So what I learned was how to, um, not, not just spread power across a bilateral uh, initiative, but to gain power from it. And hopefully the power gaining went both ways. And by power, I don't mean you know, decisions or money. I mean the power to make a change. Um, so you know, in the end, it turns out to be quite easy. It's just, we haven't finished yet. Yep, and you know, from the beginning of your efforts, I mean, um, just to give everybody a bit of background who's watching, uh, you established the Athens Ethical Principles in 2006, and that was part of a drive to engage the global business community to participate in anti-trafficking efforts. And you have seven key principles which provide action plans for businesses to contribute to the eradication of human trafficking and child labor. And so, 
you have managed to establish a sort of multilateral agreement. And I was wondering how your efforts have evolved since the establishment of the principles. Well, the end human trafficking um, Athens ethical principles now have a hundred thousand um, uh, signs, signatures from uh, companies, corporations, international organizations, international corporate federations, uh, etc. So. Uh, that's gone uh, pretty well and um, I, I never measure the success of something by did you get the did you get the contract signed and did the customer agree to it that's fine if you're in a corporation it's about the next step which is did you implement that contract and did we get the return um, and the equitable partnership that we forecast in the contract with the customer so the Athens ethical principles work great and um actually you've just reminded me there was a guy that was on the board there called jean-michel jarre who uh, was and still is quite a famous musician and he promised me because in the press conference at the end of it i saved his life because the press were giving him as a um, a musician a hard time i saved his life and he said any any of my global concerts like the ones on the great wall of china or anything else and um, i insist i invite you to i've forgotten that so I must ask him. But anyway, the um, the implementation for me is more as important as the initiative. So we've got up to 100,000 companies uh, signed up on the Athens Ethical Principles. I just want to know what they've done about it after they've signed it up. Look, the Athens um, the End Human Trafficking Now, which um, started that, um, I think our annual budget was one and a half million a year one and a half million swiss francs a year so it was impossible for us to take it to the next step which was verification of implementation so um many times these days i, I tend to work uh, quite a lot on and honestly there are thousands of amazing initiatives out there trying to help people in dire straits to stop people being trafficked to stop abuse of workers, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There are many out there. Um, the funny thing about them is they refuse to work together. So maybe we don't need a UN3. Maybe what we need is a global not-for-profit two, which somehow binds them together, which will give them much more financial power, much more outreach, much more partnership potential. So a lot of my work today is going to these or working with these organizations on um, implementation, verification, um, you know, okay, so uh, had this fantastic um, uh, initiative started in Nepal in the high hill communities. Um, and the biggest problem there, which sound, it's kind of counterintuitive, biggest problem there is lack of water. And you know, hold on, it's right in the middle of the Himalayas and it's full of snow for seven months of the year. The problem is that the uh, topography is like a pyramid and the rivers run through the bottom of the pyramid and people, if they lived in the bottom, they'd get washed away every flood season. So the communities are on the top. Guess what? There's no water at the top. So typically women and children spend nine hours a day with big plastic buckets on their backs going down two kilometers, filling them up and taking them back to make um, survival crops. So what we did was we worked out with some technology companies and um, a couple of local foundations. Um, how could we produce uh, a gravity feed pump for water that would work over two kilometers, uh, that would work off solar power and would cost less than $100 each? <laughs> So we went out to technology um, organizations, engineering organizations that I know, and we produced one. And then we started installing them. This allows women to actually do something different in helping their children's education, in helping to plant cash crops rather than you know, subsistence crops, sell them and improve the standard of living, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you start something like that and then we had some support from the government then the government changes and the government says because you're doing this in the old 
um, uh, communist supporting areas of Nepal because Nepal had this kind of communist insurgence for a while. Um, we're not going to support you to do it. And their support was the implementation. We had done the ideation, the structuring, the technology, the sourcing, the whole thing. The government with the local provider was responsible for delivering. So far, after seven years, they've delivered one gravity feed pump. They've got something like 900 in storage in Kathmandu. So my, my shift has gone from a, learning that there were so many problems like this. B, saying, okay, maybe because of the industry I'm in, those are the ones that I want to focus on. Then next, getting a huge, amazing support network of inspirational people worldwide to help. Then next, helping found or co-found or support many organizations that are already in place. And then... I guess the, it's not the last transition, I'll still be around for another 30 years, so there may be another one, um, is to find a methodology to make this multilateral implementation work, because it doesn't right now. And I know one of the questions you're, you're going to ask me is, and I'll, I'll just lead into it anyway, so save you the, uh, the time, is, you know, if, if, individuals at Houston of are, are, are looking at trying to make um, some inroads into these huge social global issues. Um, I would say the focus, because there's loads of money out there. Honestly, there's loads of money. There's loads of organizations. The problem is in implementation. And I came up with this thing, I don't know, about 20 years ago in my corporation back then and introduced this, this phrase because I found we had fantastic products, fantastic people, great customers, but there was a bit of a gap there in terms of implementation. So I just made up a phrase, excellence in implementation. So what I've done now is taken that to um, what I'm trying to devote myself to, including my current doctoral paper uh, on how to improve the public uh, process of um, passing social, socially positive legislation in the United Kingdom, which uh, sounds very complicated, and indeed it is. So I would encourage anyone to think about, yeah, yeah, you can join a foundation, you can support something, you can write an amazing paper on, on something. For me now, the most important contributions could be how do we implement uh, in a very positive way where none of the multilateral players abuses the process. So for me, it's all about implementation now. We've got loads of great ideas, fantastic people. There's loads of money out there. It's all about an organization or a set of organizations or a process that can help implement this stuff. So do you think that humanitarian work should remain apolitical then to enhance implementation? There you have proposed an impossibility uh, because all uh, humanitarian work is involved with humans. All humans live in a political, uh, either military, non-military, democratic, communist, um, you know, whatever uh, infrastructure. Therefore, it's impossible for, and you know, I've, I've worked beyond um, just UNHCR in the UN. I've worked with the International Red Cross. Um, I've worked with uh, UNODC, uh, office, that's the Office of Drugs and Crime, which is very interesting, by the way, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And what, what, what you realize in the end is that there is no such thing today as a, a, a unilaterally not-for-profit, for-profit, foundation, corporate, governmental, international organization. It's like a spider's web. And that's why it's so hard to change it. If, if it was just all socially um, leaning, not-for-profit organizations um, are totally independent and apolitical and will implement, well, the answer is they can't implement if they're apolitical. 
uh, you know, for instance, when um, Medicine Sans Frontier goes to Chad, they've got to work closely with the government or else they, they, they don't stand a chance. And even though they'd probably get shot anyway, um, you know, it's better if you've got some government support and protection. So, no, I'm just making the case that um, what we started off with, which is the complexity of multilateral solutions, is for me the big um, step that we need to overcome. You can't make them less complex because of uh, vested interests. So if you say to a government, um, Germany, you're now going to become a not-for-profit organization and you are not going to get uh, elections anymore. You've just got to get the job done. Okay, look, I'm being ridiculous, but to change the current governance construct is so, so hard, uh, but it deserves a whole lot of attention and a lot of focus, especially from young, hugely intelligent people at Ustinov. Well, that's actually a great transition because um, now I'd like to discuss your work with our college as well, if that's all right. So um, you work closely with Durham University as a whole. You're a member of our alumni community yourself. And I know that as a former Hatfield member, you retain close links with their college community. Yep. And also very generously work with Ustinov College by offering students the opportunity to apply to the Arclight Research and Travel Fund in order to motivate creative problem solving and research. Yep. Um, so if you had to summarize your call to action in one line, what would it be? Never stop fighting till the fight is done. There you go. <laughs> um, I, I would say to any individual that feels a passion for doing the right things that involve developing our global society. I don't care what cause um, you choose. Just check it out, verify it, make sure it's doing good things and actually trying to implement. And then get involved with them and then never give up till the fight is done. Which is, by the way, I think of a phrase every day that I talk to my companies, the family firm, uh, about. And I think I've used that one more than often. And I think people in the uh, various family firms in India, Switzerland, UK, wherever else, um, are going, oh God, can't he come up with something different? And the answer is no. Choose a passion, choose a mission, choose how you think you can best contribute and then once you get engaged, never give up till the fight is done. Because I won't. That's great. And I think your point about choosing anything, and it doesn't really matter what the situation is, as long as you're sort of devoting yourself and committing yourself to bettering society on a whole, I think that's a great point yeah. to make because I know so many people are sort of trying to find their feet about what they believe in what, and what they stand in. And I think that's very encouraging to know that as long as you're doing something, you're helping in some way. Um, and by the way, can, can I just say, don't be afraid, any individual, if you're getting into something that you think, I'm not really an expert here, and I don't really understand this, and whatever. If you have a passion for it, you can learn everything. Uh, one example, somebody from Houston off one day uh, came up to me um, and said, I've got this, um, this project in a junior school close to here. And I said, which one? They said, Bear Park. I said, well, Bear Park was where I grew up. I didn't go to Bear Park Junior School. I went to Neville's Cross Junior School, which was just down the road from uh, our fantastic uh, campus. And I said, oh, well, what are you doing there? And they said, um, we're doing a, an amazing transformational maths project for young people. And I, my first thought was, oh, bloody hell. Um, um, it's not my favorite area. I don't know much uh, pedagogy in mathematical development, whatever else. And I just, I just said to them, what's the project? And this lady laid it out and amazing. And I said, look, I'm involved because I have a passion for it. Not just because I grew up there, but because of what you're trying to do with young people's development. So on that, 
just like I was scared that it's a maths project, <laughs> don't be scared if the project sounds out of reach, um, unfathomable for you. Just if you feel for it, get involved with it. And you know, all the rest, all the background, you know, you can, you can fill that in. That's great advice. Um, on that line, what do you consider to be your most meaningful accomplishment so far? Uh, still being alive. Um, uh, that, <laughs> no, seriously, that, that, is, that is one. Uh, given all of the uh, dodgy places I've had to travel with various organisations and uh, some of my original work after university was in a uh, certain military organisation which was very, very dodgy. Uh, but outside of, of, of that, uh, my, my, my biggest, um, the most gratitude I have is for people that weren't involved in something to become involved in something. So for me, I'm, I'm most proud when a Ustinov um, uh, graduate comes up and says, I've got this project and I want to do this. And I go, yeah, I'll do whatever I can. What I'm proud of there is not necessarily the initiative, although that's really important in the end, but it's the passion for the individual to want to go and make a change. That's what I love. And I said, well, why did you think of me? She said, I saw some video that you did and you said, you know, um, get involved. And so I thought with my skill set and everything else, I'll get involved. So I'm really proud of that uh, transition. I'm really proud of the transition of a number of the not-for-profit organizations like Global um, Alliance to end, you know, end Human Trafficking, the um, Global Business Coalition Against Human Trafficking, End Human Trafficking Now, uh, More to Life in Florida. I, I'm happy that I've helped the individuals that really get the job done to make a transition and believe in themselves. That's what I'm most proud of. It's not me, it's nothing I've done. It's me helping individuals to make the transition to doing something great, simpler. And by the way, I think that is one of the measures of what a real leader is. It's not about the bottom line, whatever. It's helping people do the best they can and be impassioned with the best they can. Yeah, long answer as usual. <laughs> it's a good answer though. And it's very important, as you said, to even just establish a dialogue about the possibilities of becoming involved. Um, however, I'd also like to know what your greatest challenge or frustration has been so far. I think it comes back to, <coughs> excuse me, um, something we mentioned a couple of times already. The most amazing people with the most amazing solutions or possibilities, and then the most fantastic support and structure, and then what I would call, um, you know, because I always put my commercial hat on in the end and say, it wasn't excellent in implementation, and it has sub-optimized the potential of the great stuff you created. So that, that's probably, if I look over all of the organizations from the UN to the British um, government, uh, parliament, to uh, Washington, uh, to uh, both sides, Washington on both sides of the country, Mexico, uh, the Colombian authorities, Brazilian authorities that I've worked with, Kingdom of um, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, who's doing a desperate job right now, um, and trying to somehow leverage these places, organizations, and people into effective implementation. It's, it's not exactly a frustration. It's a key focus for me right now. I say to people, never be frustrated. If you think you're frustrated, work out what it is, do something about it and then get get something done okay so i'm i'm really frustrated uh, i'm annoyed that things aren't implemented to the maximum effect or possibility so that that that's really what bugs me well my next question was going to be what advice you'd give your 21 year old self but that sounds like a good answer is just to 
find what really frustrates you and act on it. <laughs> um, the advice I'd give my 21 year old self, who probably wouldn't understand what I was talking about because the 21 year old, the 20 year old, um, um, his life revolved around running the university disco, playing rugby for the first 15, um, attempting to pass uh, as many papers uh, as he could, just at least to get a degree. Uh, but I would have told him, uh, keep doing what you're doing. The reason you got into Durham University was because you were good at something. And it wasn't initially an academic thing. I was pretty good. Um, well, very good, sorry, to be modest, under-19s rugby player. And Durham actually came along and suggested that I might like to go for an interview at the university. So I had a skill. I was in the right place at the right time in the right era because that doesn't happen any Well, unless you're an American sports uh, college, uh, that doesn't happen any anymore. Well, mostly. It still happens at Loughborough and Bristol and Durham. No, uh, anyway, no, sorry to uh, say that. But it's important not just to be in the right place at the right time with the right potential skill. The important thing is to recognize when you're in that spot. So if you get an opportunity and you know, you've got all the bits and you're going, oh, should I do that? Doesn't sound like my kind of thing, really, going to Durham University. My dad wants me to join the Royal Marines. And, uh, and I'm going, ah, maybe I want to be a merchant um, navigation officer with Royal Dutch Shell or something. Um, but it just seemed right at the time. And um, so I took the decision. You could say that that started my, with, without Durham University, uh, I would never have uh, gone into, um, had anything to do with psychology or gone into um, organizations afterwards in the IT sector like Hewlett Packard. Um, and I, I always say that probably that was the most important decision of my life. Um, and I'd have given myself at that age when I made the decision to go to Durham University, it was actually 18, whenever, 17 and a half. I'd have given the advice of if it feels right get involved with it and do it, but devote your whole self to it. And then just wait till the next right opportunity in the right place, the right time comes up and make darn sure you recognize it and take it. You know, people, because of what I've done, ask me about, you know, my career, career development. You know, you must have planned your career. Um, you know, whatever, you went from here to here to European organizations to global and this and whatever. And they say, how did you plan that? And my answer is, uh, this was uh, a question that I got at an um, MBA class um, in, at INSEAD um, fairly recently. And I said, don't fool yourself. There's no such thing as life planning or career planning. It's all situational. So recognize the situation you're in and act upon it. Anyway, so that's what I would have told myself. Just keep on doing what you're doing, but make sure you make the right decisions. So. That's great. I think especially in today's climate, there's such yeah. a, a terrifying sense of, you know, you need to find your job now. You need to know exactly yeah. what you want to do. And I think that's, those are words to live by. Mm -hmm. um, and finally, uh, this interview is being released as part of our Osnov Meet series in a week to mark what would have been Sir Peter Osnov's 100th birthday. And I understand that you've actually met Sir Peter yourself. And I was wondering if you had any reflections that you'd like to share as we remember him this week. Uh, I had the great privilege of meeting Sir Peter a number of times, but not under the circumstances that many people would think, you know, either at a reception in London or something at the university when he was chancellor or whatever else. In the old days, when I first joined uh, Manpower Inc, as it was then, I headquartered myself in Geneva in Switzerland. And even back then, I was doing maybe 200 flights or more a year most of them on what then was called uh, Swiss Air, uh, which was an independent company, it later got bought out by Lufthansa and, what, and became Swiss. But back in those days, they were, they were co-headquartered in Zurich and Geneva. After you've done two, three hundred flights a year for more than a couple of years, most airlines want you to be uh, what they called in those days a VIP, 
okay? And VIPs got special treatment, like there was a special terminal for us in every location, um, a, a special VIP lounge, but it, it was very exclusive. I don't know why they let me in, maybe because I was traveling more than anybody else on Swiss Air, but um, it was very exclusive. So in Geneva, one would meet in the VIP lounge the most amazing people. Very early on, uh, before she got ill and died, I met Audrey Hepburn there. One day I was sitting there talking, and this sounds so pretentious, but it's not. It was just normal then. Sitting, talking to um, across the table from me with a glass of champagne, um, so Roger Moore and um, uh, Sophia Loren. Okay. And sitting there, oh, in the back um, later was a guy called Phil Collins, who subsequently we found out was having an affair with somebody in Switzerland and married her. But anyway, that's a different story because he ended up being my next door neighbor in, in, um, in just outside of Geneva. But um, in walks this, this guy and it was uh, Sir, Sir Peter. And there were only, I don't know, 10 seats in this VIP lounge, which shows you there weren't very many VIPs. And so we, um, he sat down, um, it, of course he knew Sophia Loren, and he knew uh, Roger Moore, who'd uh, married, you know, the second best James Bond, but married into literally what was the Swiss royal family, or the vestigial royal family of Switzerland, which is why he was living there. And they all lived along the north of the lake, like I did, you know, from Lake Geneva along towards um, uh, Lausanne and Montreux and whatever else. So. Peter starts talking to Sophia Loren and he said, I'm really, really excited about something. She said, oh, are you doing any uh, writing or film work or lecturing? Or He said, oh, I'm, I'm doing some lecturing at, um, at Durham University. And Sophia said, what, the one in uh, Raleigh in the US? And uh, so Peter said, no, no, the third oldest university in England. <laughs> and he described where it was. And of course, my ears pricked up. I was talking to Roger Moore at the time. I think he was about to do his last um, um, James Bond movie or something. And um, I said, um, I must say hi. Uh, great fan of everything you've done. I love your writing. Um, I, I've loved the uh, satirical movies that you've um, been in and made. Uh, and I, I love your devotion to a few humanitarian things because I think you and I might have been in the same room on this UN initiative and this one. And he said, yes, we were. I'm sorry we didn't meet. He was so gracious, introduced himself. And I said, the reason my ears uh, kind of pricked up was not just because it's you, of course, you know, I haven't been interested if it was just you, um, because you mentioned Durham University. I said, I'm um, a graduate from Durham and I've kept in, in, in touch. And he explained to me what he was trying to do, uh, his role, uh, the formative days, I think, of Ustinov, or, you know, looking forward to it, because I don't, Ustinov still, I don't think it'd been created then. I, I'm maybe wrong, getting the timelines wrong, but anyway, he said, you must get back involved with the university. And so he got me involved with the alumni uh, organizations, mostly to help them raise money in the United States, by the way, to start with. Uh, then I got back in touch with my college, with Hatfield, uh, and then um, the um, it, Maggie, um, who, who'd actually seen some of the transition, uh, she was the one before Glenn, you know, Maggie O'Neill was the, um, the, is it the Dean at Eustinoff or a, um, what, what, what do you call the Chief of Eustinoff College? Dean. But um, Dean, yeah. So Maggie was the one before Glenn, um, and she had kind of seen some of the transition from the earlier days. And I kind of got involved, and I fell in love with the place at the old uh, campus, and, and and just you know really really liked it. And sadly, before I went uh, and uh, kind of got involved with Houston, um, Peter, uh, Sir Peter died. But the, the, that's how I got to know him. And he's the reason I got involved back with Durham University. And it's such a chance passing in a VIP lounge in Geneva. But the end of that story is even 
better. So we all went our different ways. And all three of us, uh, Sir Peter, um, Sophia Loren, and myself, all got in a VIP car to the same Geneva, London flight. So we're the last ones to get on board. We're all sitting at the front. So I carry on talking with Sophia Loren and whatever else. We all get off the plane and Peter said he was actually uh, taking the train up to Durham or something. And so the next day I flew back on the return Swiss flight. And guess who's sitting next to me again? Sophia Loren. And we, we get off the plane in Geneva, all, all of the kind of passengers are waiting for the buses to turn up and this big black limo turns up and Sophia walks down and some people in the crowd are taking pictures of her and I walk down right behind her and we both get in the back of the same limo, okay, to go back to the VIP lounge to then go to immigration. And Sophia Loren, I'll never forget this, amazing, she turned to me and she said, David, we flew out together yesterday and we returned together today and the public have seen us. People will talk. <laughs> I mean, and she, even then, she must have been 60, 60 something then, but still gorgeous looking, uh, etc. And one of my one of my most treasured memories is Sophia Loren saying people will talk about her and me. And I thought, probably they'll talk about you, not about me. But that, that's originally how I met Sir Peter. And he, he is the reason I got really fully back involved with the whole university. Well, it's our privilege, really. And I just wanted to thank you again for participating in this interview today. Uh, it's been great to hear about your experiences, both with your career to date and with Sir Peter Osnock himself. So thank you so much. It's been lovely. It's been uh, my, my pleasure. When, when you get to be uh, as ancient as me, it's always a pleasure to think back on nice experiences. But also, as you made me do, think about the things that need to be done better. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you again.